Uh, welcome along to episode four of Minds of Giants. I have with me uh, distinguished professor Paul Spoonley from uh, Massey University. Uh, you are the, I've gone through and after Good. a quick Google search got in your uh, various accolades. Yes. So you're the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. I am. Uh, you've led various externally funded research programs, uh, written and edited over 20 books. Mm -hmm. uh, worked at various tertiary institutes around the world, including Berkeley in California. Yes. Um, and you often appear in the news media, whether TV, radio, or in articles talking about various things. Most of what I could find seemed to be related to immigration and sort of the idea of the family unit in New Zealand. Mm. Well, mainly because we've had incredibly high levels of immigration since 2012 yeah so it's been top of mind for of course yeah the media so that's why it's been particularly o obvious in the sort of last five or six years cool, mm. cool. well exactly sort of what i was <coughs> looking to talk to you about first is well actually um so you were class yourself as a sociologist i am a sociologist i trained originally as a geographer and a sociologist okay but i went to the uk and did a master of science and race relations yep. at bristol and so that moved me into sociology so when i was appointed here at massey university in 79 mm. i was appointed as a sociologist so i am a sociologist cool what well why so why what piqued your interest in that Initially, um, it was a mixture of being interested in the social mm. and what people did and how they did it. Yeah, um, but it was also a series of quite serendipitous events. Yeah. So one of the things I did in the UK was I did this um, <clears throat> program, masters in in race relations, and I had to do three papers, yeah. and then I had to do a dissertation, and I had two events happened in quite short. Um, in quite a short period. Yeah. One was a, a young Pakistani was held down and a swastika carved in his stomach with a razor blade Christ. near where I lived in okay. Bristol. And the other one was a, an Indian woman answered the door of her house in Birmingham in the UK and the young um, National Party, nothing to do with our National Party, but the young <laughs> National Party in the UK set her alight, set her, oh, wow. poured petrol over the sari and set her alight. And I was the son of a migrant from Liverpool. Yeah. And I had always imagined Britain being this bastion of liberal democracy. Yeah. And that wasn't what I was experiencing. And so that piqued my interest. And it's that, those sorts of events, and there's been a series of them, which have encouraged me to say, well, why? What, why, is, why are people acting like that? What, what makes them want to act like that? What beliefs underpin mm. what they do? Fascinating. Wow. Oh, okay. So that brought you, and then eventually you ended up, like you said, from coming from the UK over to here. Yep. Why here? Um, I was based in Auckland. Um, Massey was going through a major growth spurt in the 70s. Okay. Uh, needed um, sociologists, and they were moving from appointing sociologists from overseas to appointing local sociologists. Mm. So in that year, um, Steve Mahari and I were appointed uh, to sociology here as part of that both growth of sociology but the sort of indigenization, meaning New Zealandness, not um, Tangata Whenua, mm -hmm. but the New Zealandness of, of sociology. And then, of course, again, one of those events that prompted my interest and Steve's interest was quite soon after we had the Springbok Rugby Tour. Oh, true. And it split the society in ways that were... Very profound mm. and quite difficult to understand now, but it was about racism. Yeah. Uh, it was about the role of Tangata Whenua, it was about rugby, and it was about national identity. Yeah. And so I, I took an interest. And what I did was I started to look at freezing works. I'd been a slaughterman. Oh, yes. So on the slaughter board at Fokatu Freezing Works. Um, and I wanted to look at freezing works, but they were changing how they employed people, mm. so they shut me out. Oh, so okay. I, I decided to look at... Um, extreme right-wing groups in New Zealand. And everybody said, well, there aren't any. Yeah. And I knew, being in the UK, I knew that there were people writing to UK. You used to write, write in those days, but they used to write <laughs> to, um, to British neo-fascist publications from yeah. New Zealand. Oh, wow. And eventually I found, mm, depends on how you count them, but between 70 and 80. 
Wow. Over a period of 20 years. Different people or groups? Yeah. Well, they were sometimes the same people moving between groups, mm. and sometimes they were groups. And bear in mind that some of the groups were tiny. Like you yeah. could have a, held a meeting in a, a telephone box. I mean, it wasn't, uh, again, we don't have telephone boxes, but, you know, <laughs> it, it, they were very, very small. Yeah. Um, and some of them, I don't know whether you want to talk about this, but some of them were pro-apartheid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, some of them were neo-Nazis. So the National Socialist White People's Party was established in the late 70s. Okay. Um, some of them were break-offs from UK extreme right-wing groups like the National Front or National Party. Mm -hmm. And then we got, on layered on top of that, we got the neo-Nazi skinheads, the white supremacist skinheads. Yeah. And then we got gangs. Um, so it, it was actually it was actually a lot more than I anticipated, even though I knew they were here. Mm. And then I did my PhD, and that was one of my first books, the, the Politics of Nostalgia, which is about extremism and right-wing extremism in New Zealand. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, mm. I wouldn't say it's wonderful, but it is incredibly interesting. Yeah. Um, I would actually like to come back to that. But sure. so you did, you're saying you covered mostly uh, far-right groups. How yes. long did you sort of, did your work focus on that? Um, well, I started um, really around the time of the Springbok Rugby Tour. Yeah. Because that really brought some of these groups to the fore. Yeah, I bet. And then, and then I'd finished it. My book was about 87, 88. So the 80s were that period of of looking at, um, not only, but largely looking at sort of the politics of race, of yeah. white supremacy, of of, of um, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist, extreme right-wing groups cool. in New Zealand. Cool. And then, so from then you transitioned into focusing on what? Well, what happened was we we got some money, and we got money to do two things. One of them was... Uh, the very first um, partnership research project mm. with Māori took place between myself and the Taifenua Oheratonga. And so that was 14 marae, and we looked at the social and economic and other capitals mm. that those, um, those communities had. And so we fed back to them, and we did a very extensive statistical analysis about trends of what was happening. And Nahiwi Tomwana, who was head of the Tai Whenua, he's now head of Ngāhiti Kahanunu, um, took it to the local uh, DHB and said, um, we want to develop um, primary health care as Māori. Yeah. So pay us, provide us with the resources. And by the way, it was called Mahi Awatea, which means work for tomorrow. Cool. So the, the project, the um, research that we did, he said, look, here's, here's the report on mm -hmm. what what's happening to the Māori communities. I'll come back in a week and we'll talk about um, what you can do for us. So there was a, a partnership with Māori which has continued and I did Ranganui Walker's biography um, uh, a few years ago. So Ranganui invited me to do, do his biography. So that connection with Māori has continued. But alongside that, we started to look at the changing nature of work. Mm. So that Labour government, 84 to 89, had really changed how we how we thought about work. It really broke the contract, the welfare contract that had existed since, well, sometimes from the 1890s, sometimes from the 1930s. Mm. And then, of course, the, the national government, which came along, and particularly in the first couple of years when you had Ruth Richardson being very powerful, yeah. uh, continued to change it, essentially to to individualise contracts, to move away from collective agreements, to move away from uh, unions and union bargaining, and to move into what I would now call the gig economy. So we move into this much more precarious labour market. And we wanted to track people and how they were thinking about how they would engage in this new, in this new economy. What, mm. what, what, what did they see as a being important educational investments or training investments or how did they see their work and that's what we can we started that in the mid 1990s and continued through to about 2005 2006 mm. and um, I, we introduced a lot of new words I mean we stressed the precarious nature of work yeah we talked about non-standard work as a growing um, form of work in New Zealand non-standard work being Anything that standard work is something that something that somebody does 
essentially nine to five, Monday to Friday. Yeah. Expectation of ongoing work. Um, anything other than that, so part time, contract, fixed term, a third party. Oh, yeah. So you're employed by a third party, not by your employer. Uh, multiple jobs. So about ten percent of all New Zealanders work at two or more paid jobs, mm. and some of them in five or six jobs. Yeah. So we wanted to capture that, and certainly by the first decade of this century, uh, we'd seen a very significant shift away from that old 20th century pattern mm. of people working a lifetime in a career yeah. to working in a gig economy. And so if you ask me in 2018 what to expect if you were going into the workforce, I would say you would expect to do somewhere around 15 to 17 jobs through a working life. Uh, it would be a lot more precarious in terms of both the job existing, mm. so the job might change in terms of you might want to be an accountant, mm. and yet in 10 years, accountancy might be a completely different beast. So yeah. what you trained for 2018 and 2028 no longer exists, because yeah. a computer or an algorithm can do it. Yeah. Um, but of course, we also, what we did was we discovered that people leaving school or a university or a polytechnic typically did around five to eight jobs before they settled on something that paid them a half-decent wage and gave them... Um, they enjoyed the job, really. They, yeah. it, it, they felt as though it was something that they wanted to do. Wow. I actually, a couple of things I noticed in that. So, you know, say you're taking these large groups and sort of breaking down what's of value to them and all that kind of stuff. Does that reflect on you as... So, like, if you... Paul were yes. to look at a group what is it that you look for just out of not not because you have an agenda or you're doing some sort of research but in general what would you look at a group and, and try to point uh, pick out or sort of observe in them particularly well can we go back to the the extreme right yes so when I did work with them on them mm -hmm. I would go and interview them so there was a couple of questions that came up why would a group that knew that your values was completely different to what theirs are, mm. why would they want to talk to you? Well, actually, most people are quite happy to talk about themselves and their, their views, in this case, their political views. So it doesn't matter that your views are very different to theirs. Mm. But, of course, my values, my views are very different to theirs. And I don't share any of the things that they believe in. Yeah. But they still have a reason for believing them. Mm. And I want to understand that. I want to understand how people make sense of the world yeah. and how they rationalize or justify how they see the world and how they act in that world. Mm. And for me, that doesn't matter whether you're a neo-Nazi or a, um, a bourgeois capitalist, just to use some old um, sociological term, or a new immigrant or um, a Pākehā who's struggling to understand what New Zealand's become. Yeah. I, I want to understand what each of those communities, those groups or those individuals, mm. I want to understand how they see the world and make sense of the world because then I can contribute to public discussion mm. and to evidence. Yeah. And so I think it's really important for somebody who's a sociologist like myself to be a public intellectual. Yeah. So talking to you in a class is fine. It's yeah. part of what I do. But if I don't take what I've discovered out there into those sort of public domains, into those commons where we talk about these things and, and try and make sense of them, mm. then I'm not doing my job. True, true. It's quite interesting because yeah, we're hearing a lot of, um, there's obviously a lot of a discourse around the way that we have discourse now, yes. whether it be in five minute chunks on Channel One News or if it's, um, you know, public presentations where like in the States, for example, you're getting picketed by groups yeah. of people that are just yelling you down. Yep. And so nothing constructive happens. No. The, the public intellectuals that we seem to have at the moment a lot of people are either, they go, oh, it's almost into hero worship of everything this person says is fantastic. Oh, okay. Yes. 
to either... I haven't encountered that, Luke, but oh, carry on. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, yes. to the opposite side of the whole idea of like a public intellectual is a bit, uh, what's the word, superficial perhaps? Mm-hmm. And, and there's some truth to that because, I mean, I do a lot of media. I mean, I would do two or three interviews of some sort in a week and they mm. might be on breakfast television or it might be Radio New Zealand so I have a regular slot on Catherine Ryan or um, recently it's been with the print media. Oh yes. And and there's some short and long formats as you well know mm. and so Catherine Ryan is great because for 20 minutes you get to talk about, I talk about demography, so you get to talk about demography mm. so you can explore an issue reasonably well in 20 minutes. But when you appear on some other formats, first of all, um, you will have agreed with a producer that this is what you talk about. And sure. by the time you get there, it might be quite different. So mm. that's, that's always a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but the other thing is that you've got to summarize what you need to say in two or three sentences. Yeah. And first of all, I, I'm not sure that many academics really can do that very well. They want to, they want to talk about the methodology and they want to talk about you know, ifs, buts and maybes. Yeah. And of course the media are not interested in that. So you, you, you do come across as being somewhat superficial because you've got to be, you, you, you've got to be able to communicate something which doesn't really do justice to the work and the evidence and the research that you've done. Yeah. I suppose you're sort of trying to simplify things that it's digestible in that yeah. chunk of space and it lacks often a lot of the nuance of what this particular subject is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But, but why I do it is because, so I, I've been commenting on the media, uh, on the, in the media on, on immigration, as you said before, and I'm just staggered at how many urban myths, mm. how many misunderstandings of what's happening in migration. So yeah. I will go on and talk to Duncan Garner or Jack Tame and say, well, actually, that's not what's happening here's what's happening yeah. in two or three sentences so you, you you try and provide an alternative voice yeah a voice of reason i hope in the media and which is based on evidence and knowledge of the detail of it of what it is you're talking about fantastic now um I suppose it's a good segue, actually, because I, w- I did want to sort of touch on the, the ideas around immigration, because, like, I grew up in, like, your standard Kiwi home. We're very, like, um, we've always been very sort of, I guess you would say, uh, blue-collar type of upbringing, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There's often the, the arguments and the ranting about the immigration and rowdy, 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 and obviously yeah. coming to university was not a shock, but it was wonderful to see that people are sort of talking about it in a far yes. more positive manner. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was actually quite surprised to learn about is that New Zealand specifically and only a few other countries in the OECD have a, a, an actual proper immigration yes. system. Yes. What are the other ones? What do they do? Well, let's make a distinction. So um, Canada, Australia and New Zealand have a pick and choose system mm-hmm. and they pick and choose according to the economic value that a migrant will add. Yeah. So 60% of the people who, who we agree to come to New Zealand as permanent uh, settlers, mm-hmm. permanent migrants, um, come under the skilled migrant category. And about 35% come under the family reunification strategy. Uh, their skills, their education, their experience is actually significantly higher than it is for many New Zealanders. Yeah. So we, we, we go out into this global talent pool and try and pick the best people, best people being defined as adding economic value to New Zealand. Mm. So there are only three countries that do that. Yeah. And when you get to the European Union or the United States, Israel's slightly different. Israel's one of the other um, societies that has been built up through immigration. There's only five. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the USA, and Israel. So Israel we put to one side, but essentially two-thirds of the people that arrive in the USA in any given year come under a family reunification provision. Okay, so like a very significant proportion of their immigrants are under that, whereas for us not so much. No, no. They don't pick on skill. Okay. So they pick on family connections, not mm. on the skill that the immigrant might supply. And then, of course, in Europe, um, you get a lot of undocumented. Mm. You also get a lot of unskilled or semi-skilled migrants. 
So in any given year, those arriving in the UK, in the, in the European Union, I beg your pardon, uh, probably have not necessarily completed secondary school. Okay. So it's a very different migrant flow. And when people say, well, look at what's happening in in Europe, that's going to happen in New Zealand. No, it's not. Mm. Because we pick our migrants quite differently yeah. to what's happening to what they do over there. They've got a big debate about what they call the Australian point system, which is actually a shared Canada, Australia, New Zealand point system, uh, but they identified as being Australian, which is fine, and they're very opposed to it. In the European Union, yes, oh, yes. and particularly in places like the UK. And and you might notice that, that Trump has talked about selecting people more carefully, mm. but no, he doesn't want the Australian point system. So it's, it's a slightly weird dynamic that's occurring at the moment uh, in terms of the numbers, the anxiety about immigration, yeah. as you found, found out in your own um, background, the, uh, the way in which migrants are seen as a problem. Yes. So um, it's, it, it shouldn't be, New Zealand shouldn't be compared with most other OECD countries in that regard. And in fact, my own argument would be that Canada and New Zealand are quite similar. Yeah. Australia's been moving away from the model of carefully selecting and then welcoming immigrants for some time. And it started under the John Howard government. You might remember that there was an election, 2001, I think, around then where they talked about the babies being thrown overboard and they yeah. they demonised migrants. Mm. And certainly when we talk about um, when we talk to immigrants, particularly from Asia, and say, well, why didn't you go to Australia? They say, well, mm, it seems a much more racist society than New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, so it's quite an interesting dynamic. And New Zealand, we're part of an 18-country comparison. Um, we are like Canada, but we're unlike the other 16 countries. Oh, fascinating. Mm. Now, with the, like, as you said, there's there's a, a ton of myths and sort of just... I these ideas about immigration and immigrants in general that people have where do you think most of those stem from is it something that's like it's always been there since from way back when we had all the issues obviously with chinese immigrants for mm. years back in the day is it something that stuck around from that or is it we're pulling because new zealand's often uh, heavily influenced by sort of whatever's happening in the u.s in terms of culture that kind mm. of thing yeah i think it's a combination of factors so um we had 33 acts to stop Asians coming to New Zealand or staying here uh, from the 1880s through, the, through to the 1920s. Um, and the effect of that was that 98% of the people that arrived through a colonial period were from the UK and Ireland. Mm. Very, very hit, um, homogeneous migration flow. And so I'm a product of that. So mm. father from Liverpool. So the first wave of non-European migration to New Zealand mm. really came from the Pacific in the 50s and 60s. Um, Nui, Tokelau, Cook Islands, who were all New Zealand citizens, but Samoa, Tonga, Fiji. And w there was a moral panic mm. in the 70s, mid-70s, uh, the overstayers campaign and, and, and all the rest of it. And that really lasted through into the 80s under Muldoon. Okay. And then, of course, in 84, we got a Labour government, and they did some really interesting uh, things. And one of them was to abandon our white New Zealand immigration policy in 86, 87. It had been, it had been going for some time, but they, they ended it in total. And so we moved to this point system, and we saw that first wave of Asian migrants mm. from Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong in the 1990s. And, of course, again, a moral, another moral panic. Mm. People reacted very negatively to it. And then, of course, since then, we, we, we've seen migrant flows that have been dominated by people coming from India and China. Yeah. Uh, the UK, number three, Philippines, number four now. And it's partly because they are different. They are, they, their, their religion, their culture, their languages are different. So we get quite anxious about that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, if, when, we, when we're in an environment where people are talking Mandarin yeah. or Hindi, um, we're thinking, what are they saying and why shouldn't they be speaking English? So it's that sort of um, cultural distance which mm. is an issue. The next thing is that we also get very anxious when things are not going particularly well in our country economically. Yeah. And then we see immigrants as a 
as a competitor. And we saw that in, in 73, the, the overstayers campaign coincided with a major economic downturn. And I would suggest that that is not coincidental, that um, Pacific migrants were seen as an economic threat mm. to New Zealanders. And then, of course, there's the third thing, which is really around a cultural threat. Are they changing New Zealand in ways that we don't find acceptable? Yeah. And so I think the three of them, you know, play out differently at different times, but also with different parts of the population. So your, your blue-collar worker mm. is much more likely to see migrants as an economic threat, Yeah, which is what we've seen in the US with Trump. Um, um, and, and middle class New Zealand, I think, well, we, we, our research shows that two things make a difference in terms of tolerance. One of them is contact, yeah, actually having contact with people, and the other one is education. The higher their education, the more tolerant people are likely to be. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you get a different dynamic playing out there, and it might be that um, there are too many Asians and we probably need to cut back on them because they... Um, they're altering our culture in some way. Mm. And, of course, we saw that in, when we saw the moral panic in the mid-1990s because they, they arrived in significant numbers into schools like Epsom Girls Grammar, high decile, very high-performing school, public mm. school. And I think some parents thought, wow, you know, what's happening here? Yeah. So there is a, there is a degree of anxiety and there is a degree of... Uh, intolerance or prejudice or discrimination that occurs. Interesting. Now, if you, if I were someone who is super against immigration, yes, what are your sort of go-to reasons as to why immigration is maybe not po uh, not maybe not necessarily good, but necessary for okay. New Zealand to sort of continue forward? So I need to convince Luke yeah. that immigration is good. Well. There's a couple of things that, um, that's really important, and we need to background it by saying the demography of New Zealand is changing. Mm -hmm. It's ageing, so there's a huge increase in the number of over 65s, and the fertility is dropping. Now, that has some consequences, and it has two in particular that immigration helps address. Mm. It doesn't address fully. One of them is that we don't have the skills or the talent pool that we need to run our businesses. Mm. So if you take something like the IT sector in New Zealand, at the moment, in any given year, there might be somewhere between 10 and 12,000 people who are required in the sector in New Zealand. About a third of those will come from our own graduates coming out of our, our education system. Mm -hmm. About a third of them will come from immigrants, but there's still a shortfall. And like other sectors, Immigrant labour, skilled immigrant labour, particularly in this case from India, which produces wonderful IT graduates, mm. is essential to our industry. We would, you know, it, it's helping bridge the gap between what we can supply in New Zealand and what we need. So that demand supply is out of kilter. The second, of course, is that we're beginning to see population in many parts of New Zealand beginning to stagnate. Mm. So we're not growing. Auckland's growing. Yeah. Hamilton, Tauranga, Christchurch, Queenstown. And then outside that, you're not seeing much growth at all. So what immigration does is it, it, it contributes to population growth, mm. but it also brings people in who are in their prime working age, in their 20s or 30s. So it helps balance the ageing and the declining fertility. Mm. And if you don't do that, you're in trouble. So look at Japan. Mm. Japan is the first modern country to see a decline in its total population, and it is struggling hugely to get people to work in essential jobs. And, of course, Japan don't, doesn't have many immigrants. Mm. So there's a, an issue there. If people wonder why Angela Merkel a couple of years ago accepted a million Syrian refugees, it was less about the humanitarian mm. aspects, that's part of it, but it's really about a ready-made workforce to yes. come in and work in, in, in German industries. So we, we're all facing that problem. We're probably 20 years 
possibly even 30 years behind Japan and Germany. Okay. But we're beginning to see those shortages. And we're about number three in the OECD in terms of skill shortages at the moment. Oh, wow. The highest skill shortages. Yeah. Yeah. So immigration is part of a story which is about meeting both skills and population decline and trying to ameliorate them. Interesting. Now... Obviously, like we've just spoken about the the reasons as to why immigration is necessary. Mm. What are? Were you convinced, by the way, Luke? I feel like I'm pretty well convinced. Oh, good. For okay. That. Yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are the negative sides of immigration? Um, in New Zealand, I think they're very particular. One of them is that we have people coming into New Zealand who don't know and are not particularly sympathetic to our biculturalism. Yeah. So that the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, the role of Māori as tangata whenua, the role of te reo as an official language of New Zealand, they might not like and they might not appreciate and, and some of them might be very opposed to it. So there's a sense in which you need to convince those coming to New Zealand or help them understand might be a better way to understand that there are very particular dynamics in New Zealand that mm. we need them to understand and be sympathetic to. And by the way, uh, I'm, we're talking about early arrival immigrants. Yeah. W- when we look at them over time and we look at their children, then they quite often do understand that particular dynamic. The second thing is they need to understand our laws, but also our expectations. So yeah. there's been quite a bit of attention paid to immigrant employers or employers of immigrants and not treating them well in a workplace. Yeah. They need to meet our expectations. They cannot treat workers in ways that we've seen sometimes recently. So so that's really important. We need them to engage with our institutions. They can vote. As permanent residents we're the only country that I'm aware of that allows permanent residents to vote in elections. Mm. So normally you have to be a citizen, not in New Zealand. But we need them to exercise their their um, citizenship, mm. even though they're not citizens. So they need to, to be able to vote. I think that's... Uh, I, I, I and some others wrote a paper on social cohesion for Cabinet didn't go anywhere. (laughs) Um, But it had two things. What do we do to help migrants adjust to New Zealand Mm. so that they become participants and involved in our society? What do we do to the host communities, you and I, in terms of understanding these and responding to them in positive ways? And I don't think... New Zealand's New Zealand's interesting. When we talk at this um, meeting in Germany that we have of the 18 countries, um, many of the issues that those other countries face, we don't. So major hate crime, um, acts of violence towards immigrants, mm. major anti-immigrant parties, not really in New Zealand. There's some, but not, not really. Um, but I think we need to work at making sure that this is a cohesive society which is welcoming and in which we have a degree of tolerance towards one another. So we don't accept genital mutilation. Mm. We don't accept physical punishment of children. You know, there are some things that are non-negotiable for us and we need immigrants and ourselves and our own communities to understand that they are non-negotiable. Cool. It's, mm. uh, so I, I think it's very important to have, obviously, the, the benefits and the necessary reasons why immigration is good. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also if you present those all the time, people go, yeah, well, you know, you're providing all this wonderful evidence, but there has to be something wrong. Yes. You know, there's always, yes. there's always a but. Yes, there there's is always, always a, but. a but. Yes, there is always a but. And, and I think that what you see in countries like our, our own around the world mm. is that people are anxious about immigration and the levels of immigration. They are suspicious about immigrants because they are different. Yeah. And um, even, you know, what's weird is that even when the majority of our migrants came from the UK, we were still suspicious of them. So through the the 60s and 70s in particular, we mounted, we being New Zealanders, mounted quite a campaign against Brits. 
And so there was a, a series of, whenever there was a radio station in Auckland, when whenever it mentioned palms or British people, yeah. they had a toilet flushing <laughs> sound. So there was, you know, even people who are culturally very similar, similar to yeah to people like myself we were still suspicious of so you can imagine what somebody coming out of shanghai or or um, seoul yeah how they are seen by our more conservative community members definitely mm. now you mentioned before in the paper that you um contributed to that you uh sort of spoke about how we help i guess um, assimilate people mm-hmm. into the, the country and mm-hmm. also what the hosts can do. do yes. What sort of, um, I guess, systems are in place at the moment for an immigrant coming into New Zealand? Yeah. Well, I think we've, I think we've gone backwards. So um, Bill English, one of his first moves as the Minister of Finance, mm-hmm. um, cut $69 million out of the adult and community education budget. Oh. And one of the things that was done in the adults and community education budget was to teach immigrants English. Yeah. Now the English that you and I talk is not even a, an English speaker from another country does find it <laughs> difficult the accent but also the words that we use. So when we talk about something like metal road. Yeah. What the hell does that mean? You know <laughs> exactly. it's just it's just weird. So we do need people to understand our colloquial English, our New Zealand colloquial English. And of course people who are not English speakers, that becomes even more of a challenge. So exactly. one of the things we need to do is to make sure that they do speak and understand that colloquial English. Really, really important. We need to make sure that our institutions are doing a good job. And I think our institutions some of them are doing a particularly good job. Uh, interestingly enough, our churches have done a good job, but it's our education system, our primary mm. and secondary sector, which has done a fantastic job in helping, of course, younger younger immigrants mm. um, understand this country. And I think if there's a success story, it's how after that initial period in the mid-1990s when all those new Asian kids arrived at Epsom Girls and people thought, what on earth is going on here? Um, the schools actually responded very positively and they do the, they've done a great job in integrating mm. uh, these communities into New Zealand. And I think uh, they should, that should be acknowledged. I'm not sure our employers have done such a good job. And when we talk to employers, um, we ask them about who they want to employ, Mm. then there are two groups that they say no. One is school leavers. Oh, yeah. And the other one is immigrants. Mm. And when you look at where they're going to get their labour from in the next 10 years, uh, those attitudes have got to change. So I was part of an economic development agency in Auckland which provided placements for immigrants in... Uh, firms and it did two things it gave them New Zealand experience Mm. which you know that's what both uh, school leavers and immigrants are lacking yeah and 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 others I mean um, graduates Uh, but it also enabled um, employers to say well Luke's arrived here from um, China I wouldn't normally employ him but he's been at my firm for three months and he's pretty damn good he Mm. turns up on time um, he works hard, he's conscientious, um, we needed to struggle a little bit and we needed him to understand our health and safety regs, but uh, we've got there, uh, we've had to invest a little bit of time in that. Um, and so once you get employers and immigrants together, yeah. um, both understand what's required of them mm. and actually it's, it's a pretty positive story. But of course many of our immigrants uh, like your own family, Luke. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm not meaning to imply your family is like this, but you know, who who sit back and see on the television something that's occurred and think immigrants are the cause of that particular problem, like yep. housing prices or um, purchasing dairy farms in New Zealand or driving posh cars very badly. Yeah. You know, they they have those those stereotypes and they really don't look beyond the stereotypes. So that's why we think contact is really, really important. Mm. And that can occur in education, in the workplace, um, in the streets. And all of that helps make people understand. And by the way, I mean, most people, 
many people, I think, in New Zealand do appreciate the positive things. Like, man, I mean, you're young, but the food has improved out of sight. <laughs> you know, just the variety of food, the cost of food, the 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 the, the quality of that food. It's it's fantastic now compared to what it was when yeah, I was growing up. I yeah, bet. yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I want to take sort of a bit of a sideways turn here from immigration and now, like your last presentation, the um, the sort of the face of families yes. in New Zealand in 2018. Um, why? What's called for this sort of transition away from immigration? Like you said, has been sort of, I suppose, the hot topic for yeah. like the last five to six years into something like that. Well, um, this decade, 2010 to the 2020, mm. is a decade of very significant demographic change. And it, 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 it started before 2010, and it'll go on into the 2020s. But the New Zealand we saw in 2000, and the New Zealand we're going to see in, say, 2020 or 2030, very, very different countries. And so what we're trying to do is track some of those changes And uh, one of them is ageing, so Mm. ageing is going to have major implications for New Zealand. Immigration is another. But the way in which we live our lives, particularly in institutions like the family, has changed significantly and will change. Mm. So I grew up in a nuclear family. The nuclear family, which is, you know, typically parents and children, and those children and parents are biologically related, Um, will increasingly become and has become a minority form of family. Mm. And and what we're looking at is a whole series of impacts that have changed the nature of family. Everything from surrogacy, non-biological parenting, so blended families, the declining fertility, the fact that um, new generations of New Zealanders, many more of them will choose not to have any children at all Mm. or only to have one child. Um, The cost of setting up a family unit, uh, by which I mean establishing a partnership, perhaps getting a job, getting a house, um, is now so expensive. And we've, of course, loaded up people coming out of our educational institutions with a lot of debt. Mm. So many things are delayed. So first birth is now typically to a New Zealand Pākehā woman, at least, is now likely to occur in her early 30s. So our Prime Minister, having given birth to a child at age 37, Mm. um, having a partner who is not a husband, uh, going back to work after six weeks, is really typical of what's occurring out there. And so many of us, I think, still probably think about families in that nuclear style of, of family, but in fact, actually, many of us don't live in nuclear families anymore. Very true, very true. Mm. Um, with the the families changing as such in New Zealand, is there a common trend among sort of, I would imagine, probably Western yep. other countries? Yes, it is. And if we take declining fertility, so last year in 2017, we went sub-replacement fertility, which mm. simply means not enough children were born that year to replace our existing population. Um, we're one of the last OECD countries to to um, hit sub-replacement fertility. So we're 1.7 births per woman, which is uh, 2.1 is replacement level, so we're below replacement level. Mm-hmm. Australia's been 1.7 for about five years. Um, Catholic Europe is down at about 1.2. So, you know, there's um, uh, other countries have been there long time before we have arrived at that same point. Mm. So we're going to experience many of those same issues. And that goes back to something I said before, which is about there are going to be more over 65 uh, people in the over 65 age group in New Zealand than there will be zero to 15. And so we're seeing this rebalancing of our population profile away from... Uh, the past where a ba- and, you know I'm part of a baby boomer generation where we the baby boomers dominated the baby boomers as, as as children and then of course people in the education system people in the workforce people coming through into politics and we'll move through and out the other end of the system mm. but the the cohorts the generations behind us will be much smaller and that's new territory for us. And we need to, you know, that's part of what I do as a sociologist. We need to understand that. Yeah. And I'm 
able to access a universal super, which I can access at age 65. Uh, when you look at the demographics of New Zealand, we're not going to be able to afford that much more. Mm. So your generation, you know, we, we, we essentially, it's um, um, a, a um, intergenerational transfer. Yeah. So the cost of the super in 2018 is paid for by you working, mm. you being a younger generation. Well, we're just going to have fewer in the younger generation, so we're not going to be able to afford it. Yeah. So we need to have a debate about the policies and the politics of superannuation. Definitely. Yes. Oh, fascinating. Um, you mentioned in your presentation the other day the idea of a beanpole family. Yes. Now, that's the first time I've ever heard that phrase oh, whatsoever. Yeah. So if you could elaborate on that, yes. it would be fantastic. Yes. Well, th- there's two there's two elements to it. One is that you're having fewer and fewer children. Mm. So I'm not sure whether you know how many were in your parents' generation or your grandparents or great-grandparents, but typically as a baby boomer, my great-grandparents would have been in families of typically between 10 and 20 children. Uh, My parents' generation both came from families of six children, Mm. and then in my generation, we're down to two children. So the the number of children is getting smaller. But what we're seeing, and this is the second element, is that we're having more generations live in the same household. Yeah. You, as somebody who might be coming out of a tertiary institution with a debt of goodness knows how many tens of thousands of dollars, um, probably can't afford to get into the housing market in New Zealand. And increasingly what you'll see is that the baby boomers, but also other generations, will be a sandwich generation. Mm. They will look after not only the younger generations, who might be adults, not might, might not be children. Yeah. And what that means is that those adult children might be living in the same household as their parents. Um, And in Italy, you know, it's surprising. They live, many live in well into their 30s with their parents Mm. before they move out of a family household. But you're also looking at older generations being part of that same household. Yeah. And um, the thing that will happen is that we're seeing more and more we're seeing longevity. So when you reach 65, the chances of you living till your 90s are high. And uh, Neve, uh, uh, Jacinda's child, Mm. should, will have an average life expectancy as a New Zealand female born in 2018 of 93. Yeah. Um, So you'll not only have your your parents' generation, you might have your grandparents living in that same household. Mm. Because you're caring for them, because yep. you're looking after them. Mm. So it's that beanpole, it's that idea of being spread out over several generations. Wow. Mm. It's interesting that the the idea of like your standard family is like your nuclear family, whereas before then, you know, the nuclear family is like normally, you know, a mother, no. father, and two, maybe three kids. Yes. It's not these large groups that what we had before that no so if you if you look at victorian england yeah then the nuclear family well there's some things we need to acknowledge first of all people didn't live much beyond their 60s true so you wouldn't have had older generations Mm. necessarily living in the in the same community or the same household but you'd have a lot of children yeah and and the idea of the nuclear family really only came into its own in the 20th century. Mm. And, of course, in New Zealand was codified in the, in the welfare state. Mm. So the Labour government thought, how do we ensure that there is a living wage for a New Zealand family? And they took a model which said two biological parents, male and female, typically mm. the male being the breadwinner, and then three children. So suddenly that nuclear family became the centre of our welfare policies in New Zealand. And it stayed that way until, of course, the 1980s, Mm. 1984, and the Labour government began to pick away at that. And, of course, we've moved away from that. And what's ironic is now in 2019, we're moving back to trying to preserve... Mm family welfare. So we've got working for families, but we've also had announcements from the Labour government about people um, needing support. And and the irony for me is that um, housing support is provided for families who earn up to $180,000 a year. Mm. 
Um, that seems to me incredibly generous, but it reflects the fact that there is quite a considerable amount of um, pressure on even middle class families. Yeah, at it's this not point. not just the lower class no, families no. that are really struggling in, no. in poverty, no. so to say. It's because you're you're often seeing these days. Um, articles and, and news pieces on the uh, like the working port the people that have they've had, had their nine to five 40 hours a week that pays really well yes but they're like not no. excelling in any no. particular way and this goes back to the work that we done ar- we've done around the labor market mm. so precarious means that of course there's no certainty of of long-term financial um, security mm. in terms of a paycheck um, but the other thing is that what we've noticed is that, of course, that even in middle class families, you need two incomes. You need both parents to be working. Yeah. And that's where the grandparents come in because they become the child carers. So there's a there's some important economic as well as cultural drivers to a lot of this. Yeah. And those economic drivers are really about making the family unit, however that is, mm. described or structured, Um, being financially secure and you will quite often see um, the need for two incomes Mm. and that typically means the two adults in the the relationship. That makes sense. Yes. Um, Do you think that in obviously with immigration sort of uh, ramping up I guess you would say Mm. um, well do you think that the large amount of immigrants we'll be getting in to maintain and sort of move our population forward, will that also change the ideas around what a family unit is? Yep, yep. And and what I haven't mentioned is that we've already always had different approaches to family. So Mm. I use the word whānau to indicate that Māori and others, but Māori in particular, didn't live in a nuclear family in the way that I lived as a Pākehā in a nuclear family. So we have alternative models. And then, of course, what we're now seeing is new migrants arriving here. And if you're coming out of Asia, then your attitude towards welfare and towards older generations is actually fundamentally different Mm. to me as a Pākehā New Zealander. So I think we're going to see quite different patterns emerge It'll be interesting to see whether the New Zealand-born, three-quarters of Asians are overseas-born, only a quarter are New Zealand-born, and that includes the Chinese who've been here since the 1860s and 1870s. Um, how, how the New Zealand-born will, will change in terms of their values and behaviour, yeah. whether they look more like middle-class Pākehā in terms of how they structure and operate inside these family units, and that's an unknown because it's still too early. Interesting. Um, I think that's actually all, well, not all I wanted to talk to you about, but it's sort of the the general gist of what I was hoping to get out of this. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Luke. It's been fantastic. I've enjoyed talking. Good, good. Now, if people were wanting to look to find your work, where is the best place for them to go? In terms of migration, uh, Richard Bedford and I uh, did a book in 2012 called Welcome to Our World, Mm. question mark, which is about immigration in New Zealand. In terms of demography, um, we did a report for the Royal Society a few years ago, but it's already out of date Mm. because things are changing so fast. So it's quite difficult to say that's where you go to get all of this. So one of the things I've been thinking about is writing a book about the demography and its implications for contemporary New Zealand. So I'm afraid um, people might have to wait a year or two to, <laughs> before that comes out. Um, in terms of work, we did the, the world of work, which was, and, and by the way, there's some fantastic material out there. Infometrics have done some work around the way in which work is changing in New Zealand. They've done it mm. 2017, 2018. So there's some really good synopsis, summaries of what's happening in the world of work. And I think it's going to change very significantly over the next 10 years. Yeah. So I think what we've seen is the arrival of the gig economy. What we're going to see is the arrival of the digital economy, mm. where a lot of jobs are simply going to be done by machines in some way yeah. using algorithms. So I think we're, we're, we're midway through mm. a new industrial revolution and I think the, there's, some, there's some quite good 
populist, by which I mean accessible, yeah. uh, summaries of that from Infometrics and uh, NZ, um, IER, the Institute of Economic Research. Fantastic. Um, where, at the, at the moment, are you planning to sort of continue on where you're going sort of research-wise, or are you looking to change gears again? No, we've, we, 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 the last research project we had was Natangata Oho Mairangi, which is looking in, at New Zealand in 2038. Mm-hmm. We've got $5.5 million to look at the social, economic, and cultural changes in New Zealand, and that's ongoing. That started in 2014. It'll finish in 2020. And we're just trying to capture. So you're talking to the soft part of the team. We've got economists <laughs> and e- econometricians and others working to, to get the data. And what we're trying to do is map these changes. Mm. So we've still got a bit of work to do. And I think one of the things is I talk very confidently about how we will work in 10 years' time. Yeah. In reality, I... I and others are not 100% certain. Mm. So there are going to be things that will arrive and will change our lives in ways that we can't anticipate. And one of the things, and this is the last example I'd use, is autonomous vehicles. So we're working with some um, firms in New Zealand who are saying, why in 10 years' time should people have a vehicle, a driver's license, mm. or actually buy a car. Why, with the combination of autonomous autonomous vehicles and um, Uber, something like Uber, yeah. um, why would you need a car? Because you'll get driven in places in ways that are quite different to now. Yeah. And, and when you talk that, about that to New Zealanders, they say, nah, <laughs> yeah, not, exactly. not, not going to happen. Yeah. It will happen. It will. Yes. It's actually all quite exciting, I think. Yes. Um, wonderful. Well, I think that's about it. Um, again, thank you for your time. This has been fantastic, and I would love to have you on to talk more in depth about, especially the far-right stuff, which is always fascinating to, to banter about. Um, cool. So everybody else, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, check the details down below for all of the appropriate links for everything we've talked about today. Otherwise, your podcasting devices should have all of that in the description as well. Uh, apart from that, thanks very much, and we'll see you next time on Minds of Giants. Cool.